Hey, it's Yannick Guzdala. It's the Yannick Guzdala podcast. We're talking about how to play in 12 keys and why I think you must learn to play everything in 12 keys, kind of no matter what style of music you play, whether you're a jazz musician like me or whether you play pop or rock or metal, whatever it is, I think it's really important to use your practice time wisely and to dedicate a little bit of that time to playing in 12 keys. Um, before we get into that, and we're going to spend the whole podcast on a ton of different ways I do it. It doesn't have to be consecutive keys one after the other. We're going to talk about having discipline to just practice in one key, but make sure you go and practice all the others as well. We'll get to all of that. But first, I want to talk tour dates. I always forget to do this, and uh, I get so many communications, emails, and messages and stuff. Hey, where are you playing? When are you coming to this place? So, <clears throat> as all my favorite comedians do on their comedy podcasts, and, and, and because of the fact that I actually have some tour dates now uh, coming up, going to use a couple of seconds to tell you about them. Um, March 22nd, the Vital Information 40th Anniversary Tour. Um, Time Flies, I think, is going to be the name of the new record we did with Steve Smith. Vital Information uh, kicks off March 22nd in American Fork, Utah, which I believe is not too far from Salt Lake City. Um, then we're in Los Angeles at Catalina's for three nights, March 23rd, 24th, 25th. Then we're going up to Oakland, California. We'll be at Yoshi's March 26th. Uh, Kumwa in Santa Cruz, March 27th. Ashland, Oregon, the Grizzly Peak Winery, March 29th. Portland, Oregon, the 1905 on March 30th. Bellingham, uh, Washington, the Jazz Center of Bellingham, March 31st. Phoenix, Arizona, the Musical Instrument Instrument Museum on April 2nd to round out kind of the West Coast leg of the tour. Um, I'll dive back into the baked potato uh, April 6th, and we already have tour dates and a ton of them for the East Coast. Um, so if you have some summer plans, end of June, middle of June through the beginning of July, we're going to be, wow, all over the place. Hold tight, uh, or, or, or strap in rather. Hicksville, New York uh, starts June 17th. Newton, New Jersey, June 18th. Sellersville, New Jersey, June 19th. Washington, D.C. at Blues Alley, June 20th. Uh, Cumberland, Maryland, June 21st. Cleveland, Ohio at the Tri-C Jazz Fest in the Allen Theater. That's June 24th. Uh, Manchester Craftsman Guild, that's in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, June 25th. Uh, we're going to be in Littitz, PA, Littitz, Pennsylvania, June 27th. Marlborough, New York at the Falcon, June 28th. And then we round out the tour with three nights at Birdland, the Birdland Theatre, the club downstairs. I actually really, really like playing that room. We played there last year. That was June 30th, uh, July 1st, and July 2nd. Um, two shows a night. So those are the dates. And then, of course, I have dates coming up with my band. Don't forget the pre-sale for the new album is on. We are going to South America. We're going to Argentina to, to spend four days in the studio with the trio plus guests and I think voices and strings, all kinds of stuff happening first week of August. The album will be out the beginning of November and I'll be on tour with my trio in Europe um, from, I think, from the beginning of November for a couple of weeks, promoting that and launching the album. If you haven't checked out the pre-sale, go do that. It's on the front page of my website, yannickguizdala.com. Links in the show notes if you're just listening to the podcast. Links in the video description below if you're watching here on YouTube. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe, leave me a comment, help the algorithm, help us get on the map with this podcast channel. That's really uh, been kind of a passion project of mine the last couple of months. I'm really enjoying doing this every week. Hope you guys and girls uh, don't mind the switch from Sunday mornings to Monday mornings. Give me some feedback on that. Kind of felt like Monday mornings, although it's not Monday morning everywhere in the world, at least on a Monday morning, people probably got a commute or you're heading to school or something, whatever you're doing, maybe you have some time to listen Sundays, maybe you're kind of switched off and doing family stuff. And Monday, I know for me, I like stuff on a Monday morning. It's kind of getting my week going. So let me know if that works for you. I'd, I'd like to keep it consistent. And it was Monday mornings, 9 a.m. Now it's, uh, it was Sunday mornings, 9 a.m. Now it's Monday mornings, 9 a.m. So that's, that's everything. Let's get into, let's get into 12 keys. Um, did I mention the pre-sale? I did mention the pre-sale. Yeah. Um, that is, if you, by the way, if you got involved in One Way Out last year, that was a, a, an incredible success. If you haven't seen my latest video on YouTube about how I lost, it's actually well over eighty thousand dollars in the studio making albums. Go check that out. It kind of chronicles my 
career as a recording artist and uh, composer and making records and how that is not that much of a viable economy to exist in. But doing a pre-sale like this and getting the fans involved ahead of time, and this time well ahead of time, and we're not recording until August, the album doesn't come out until the beginning of November, by getting fans, people who are truly engaged and interested in the music involved ahead of time like this, made, made it possible to break even on a record last time, which is the first time doing that in my career. So thank you for that. If you were involved in that pre-sale, you know, kind, kind of know how it works. There were many tiers last time, layers and uh, uh, different bonus levels and stuff. Th this time it's just one one price for, for everything. And we are making a documentary. There will be a film that you'll have access to. There will be a poster with everyone's name on it like I did last time. I thought that was kind of cool. Got some good feedback about that. Um, so yeah, there will be some, some things like that. And that kind of pool of... Of, of bonuses and items that you kind of have access to through the pre-sale will actually grow over the next few months as we approach the studio time. That's why I wanted to do it so early, starting here in February, March. Um, and uh, yeah, if you want to get involved, that's at yannickwasdala.com. It's right on the homepage. 12 keys. You, I, I'm, when I warm up, um, no matter what shape I take or what idea, so I play this major idea in F. We're talking conceptually here. I'm not like I'm not going to go over every single note in every single exercise because it's really conceptual that, and something you can apply to to vocabulary and to information you already have in in your arsenal. I, I would say that's probably a really good place to start if you're trying to work on 12 keys and get used to that process is maybe take something you know, like take something that is familiar to you, something that you know you can move around the instrument and just get used to the concept of doing that, not just playing it in the couple of keys that feel comfortable or maybe feeling like you don't have the time um, to, to go through all 12 keys. It's amazing what you can get through in a very short period of time. I have on this podcast and on my YouTube channel many times highlighted how long two minutes feels and how how actually how many times I can get through certain exercises in all 12 keys in just two minutes so there really is no excuse time wise even if you only have five or ten minutes a day to practice you can get around the instrument in all 12 keys and um, that's what we're that's what we're going to do so that exercise this kind of uh, kind of taken from the Hannon virtuoso pianist this uh, piano exercise book that is kind of responsible for a lot of my technique um, and that was something I used a lot very early doors when I picked up the bass. I'll play that. That, that was that was in F there. Um, I will often use two um, two techniques. One is the the cycle of fourths. So if we start off in F, I don't start in the same key every time. Um, it, it really doesn't matter. It's actually better if if it's totally random. Here just happened to be F for no reason. So the next one in the cycle of fourths, I would go up a fourth and go to B flat. Also important when we're talking about the warm up and getting into your practice routine is to be very honest about where you are in terms of how your body feels and what you need from the warm up process. Not even what you need from your practice routine and music you have to work on and stuff you're interested in. No, no, forget about that for just a second. Listen to your body and ask uh, you know, listen, listen to what it needs in terms of where you are. Now, I played a gig last night, so I'm actually feeling pretty good. Um, that It's not like it's, I haven't played for two or three days. Like we played two hard, long sets last night, and my, my chops feel good, and I'm quite relaxed. I've had a nice morning. Like I'm, Those are all the things, that the feedback that I'm getting from my body. I've already been out and taken a nice long walk for a couple of miles in the uh, brisk but sunny Southern California winter we're having here. Some beautiful snow on the mountains and stuff. It was very... Um, I felt very, very... Uh, grateful this morning to be walking around my neighborhood and looking out at the mountains and thinking, wow, this is kind of a, a an incredible place to live right now. I, I've, I've doubted that at times recently, and I've thought about, you know, moving to Europe, moving to all kinds of places, actually. And uh, it, it, really, it was just a case, what I needed was to get out of my studio for 40 minutes and take that nice, long, slow walk and uh, and take it all in and so yeah, that gave me great feedback mentally there and good feedback about, hey, my body's feeling good, it's feeling warm, I'm feeling relaxed. So all of that to say, if you think, wow, I'm kind of diving in there pretty quick because these are the first notes of the day for me. If you think, ah, oh, that's a little bit 
kind of technical sounding and uh, maybe a little bit too hard to go in. It's just because I feel good. Um, and there are other days where I will literally, and you've heard me, I'm sure if you've listened to the podcast before, you've heard me use this. I'll just take one four note diminished chord and I will play kind of medium slow eighth notes because sometimes my chops are in bad shape and I don't feel good and I really need to warm up the muscles. So let's, all, let's always keep that in the back of our mind about, okay, we, we really should listen to our bodies when we sit down with the instrument. And if you are a regular listener of the podcast, you are going to hear me repeat things. Um, I'm absolutely going to do that like pretty much all the time. Um, I'm going to repeat the important stuff. I don't think you can talk about the important stuff too much. Um, and if you're a casual listener to the podcast, that maybe you skip a few episodes, or maybe this is the first time you're listening, it's good to good to hear that information. So at every opportunity, I'm going to remind myself, and at the same time, anyone who's listening, about those most important elements of my routine and my process. So we went from F up to B flat, and we go into cycle of fourth. So next would be E flat. Um, I have the reverb on actually, I'm going to take that off so it's totally, so it's totally clean. Let's go to A flat. And because the, because this exercise, uh, let's just stop talking while I'm playing. Because this exercise starts on the fifth degree of the key center. So when I was in, in F, it started on started on C and descended these kind of four note cells in major, major four note cells. Um, because of that, when you get to the end of the exercise um, and you're moving in a cycle of fourths, your root note is the fifth of the key that is a fourth above. Like that's a lot of words to describe something that's very simple. So we, we're in F, but we start on C. That's the first note of the exercise. And we get we get all the way down. And we end on F, right? We end on the tonic. Now, when we move a fourth to the key of B flat, guess what? F, the, the note we ended on, is the fifth of B flat. So it's the starting point of the, of the next key when you're moving in the cycle of fourth. That's just a little byproduct of the way this exercise works. But it's something I like about it. It's a nice connecting thing. It's putting my ear. It's really like being in control of, um, of, of, of a note and understanding all the options that you have for it. I think this is one great thing about working in 12 keys is that there are no, hopefully once you do it, for, for long enough and it's a part of your everyday routine and it's second nature it's something that's in your muscle memory there's no disconnect no matter what key you're in and then you can start to hear single notes and hear everything that they could possibly be associated with now of course f we're associating in this case as the tonic of one uh, one key and the and the fifth of another so that's a pretty pretty basic use, you know, uh, interchange of, of one note. It's the root here, it's the fifth here. But then the more you do these kind of exercises in the, and it's not just all 12 keys, but I think all 12 keys helps a lot. And of course helps your fluency in the language. You're going to start to be able to know that, have a feel for, okay, yes, that's a fifth and that's an octave. And just the relationship between these two keys moving in a fourth okay that's another thing so we've got this root motion but then you you will start to get a feel for the fact that when you go to the to the fifth of the key that F now is a fourth and when you go to the sixth of the key that F now is a minor tenth in this case or a minor third You go to the third of the key, that F is now a minor six. So you're going to have all of these, all of these associations with one note and what, what, how powerful one note is and where that one note sits. That one note is just, isn't just a, a note in a scale of a key. It's interchangeable with so many other aspects of, of a harmony. And I think the, the, the repetition of 12 keys really promotes 
fluency and fluidity when you're trying to and it, this isn't just about jazz and this is not just about improvisation or playing solos or anything like this is just about the fu- the fundamentals the foundation of harmony which i think as as bass players we have we have great control over that we're, we're one of the most uh, uh harmonically and melodically potentially powerful instruments in the in the band um i posted something to my to my sub stack to the blog um a couple of days ago uh, if you want to go check that out it's a ballad from a from a gig we did uh, with bob reynolds at the baked potato and i was talking in the blog about how you know i used to be under those sort of pressures or guidelines or suggested kind of mode modality uh, when posting clips and sharing things to social media of like oh i should post the most burning song or the or the craziest changes or the fastest solo or you know the most dynamic thing here or there because you you wanted to hook people in the first few seconds to engage with the content and potentially like it and leave a comment and all of those things and sharing videos on the blog that they're not youtube videos that are embedded they are videos that are just on the on the blog like only people on my mailing list will see that and there's no like success metric uh, associated with it i don't i'm not thinking about oh i do have i'm not thinking about any of those things i just mentioned basically and what i shared was a seven and a half minute ballad where there is no bass solo and there's no crazy unison line and no coda that goes round and round seven times and eight and a half over 17 this that and the other time signature there's none of that it's just a super diatonic tune with four or five chords in it um, with this beautiful melody and and despite not having all of those sort of Instagrammable elements that music seems to require online these days, I, as a bass player I was able to be melodic um, and rhythmic and I was able to work as a team uh, with the rhythm section to really elevate what Bob was doing as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a soloist and as playing the melody of his tune and that, that kind of all circles back around to how powerful the bass is in the band. There are certain elements of that tune where um, when we go to kind of the B section, it's, it's a tune called um, Unlucky. This is actually a good example of kind of interchangeable notes. And we will get back to the 12 keys thing. This is all related and this is exactly how I work on this stuff in my, in my routine. So Bob's tune Unlucky, um, which I normally play the first, the melody. So the, the, the A section is just E minor and G and B minor and A. So it's just these four chords, super diatonic. And then when, when we go on, we go to the bridge. That's the kind of the melody. But it's just G for a whole bar, going to A, and then that repeats. And sometimes when it repeats, I go, it's still G, but it's a first inversion. And it's A, but it's also a first inversion. So the third is in the root. And then the third time, I'll invariably play it in the root position again. And then let me get B, A sharp diminished going to B minor, to E, seven maybe, and then G. We walk up to A, to B minor, and then it goes major. To get back to our, to get back to our A section there. Um, so the power of just being able to change a couple of notes, uh, those interchangeable notes, instead of playing the root over the uh, under the G and the A, to be able to play the the the, the, the third under each chord and, and just create a slightly different color in the music. That, the ability to do that and hear that and do it in the moment, albeit I've been making that change to that tune for a long time. That is not, not something I came up with last night by any stretch of the imagination. Um, Russell and I are just massive fans of first inversion major chords. That's it. That's just the, the, that's just the way it is. And we, we shove them in there all over the place. And because we've been playing that tune so long, at some point it was the first time. And the, the, way I was, the reason I was able to do that was because of these practice routine elements. Um, and it kind of comes back down to being so 
fluid in fluent in multiple keys. So, like I said, I use the cycle of fourths quite often when um, when I'm warming up and I have a you know maybe maybe it's an arpeggiated thing. Let's take something totally different. So. Maybe I'll hang out in one key for two cycles of the exercise and then go up a fourth. So I started in C minor there. That is F minor. Now B flat. E flat. A flat. Bit of a bigger stretch there. C sharp. Or D flat. I just hate D flat minor as a chord symbol. Then F sharp. To B, sorry, and then E. Ah, to A. Ah, and then to D. We're already at our last one in the cycle of G. And I'm not sure, but I'm I'm pretty certain that was under a minute, and I got through two two octave arpeggios in each key, in all twelve keys, um, in under a minute. So that should highlight to you like there's no excuse for, for time. Um, I think it's just a matter of a little bit of discipline, or even just knowing to do that, um, having that as part of something you're conscious of when you sit down with your instrument. Really important. Um, we're going for our first first hydration break here. Oh yeah, um, it it should also be noted. I who did I? I think I heard. I think I heard Victor Wooten um, talking about Anthony Wellington, um, another great bass player, um, an educator, and uh, I, I. I mean, we don't talk that much, but I'd like to call him a friend. A super cool guy, and uh, love being around him. Love hanging out with him. Got to play with him a few times. Uh, uh, Anthony, that is, um, and Vic. I, I, I don't know, he was in an interview or something, or was it on my podcast? I don't remember. I just remember him talking about being at a at an Anthony Wellington clinic or them do it, teaching a lesson together and talking about 12 keys. And um, Anthony saying, well, actually, there are 30 sometimes, what is it, 36 or something. Um, you know, what about practicing all 30 plus keys? And Vic was like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, you know, like, like I said then, I, I went from... I went from A flat uh, uh, minor, and when I went up the fourth, I said C sharp minor because I don't like D flat minor as a as a chord symbol or a key signature. It's in, in, an insane key signature because really the relative major is F flat, and I don't even want to think about how many flat. They're just probably everything is flat. Um, it's just a, a very complicated uh, way to access music when there's that much. Inform, uh, kind of unnecessary information on the page in terms of reading. Um, so where I, where Anthony is obviously completely correct, and there are what are known as enharmonic equivalents. So um, an E flat is also a D sharp. Like I said, a, a D flat is also a C sharp. So you could there are different names for exactly the same notes. And I think some people will argue that uh, they are slightly different. Um, I think there are a lot of like deep philosophical arguments for that. Uh, I am have no doubt at all that, like, the first person who springs to mind actually is Adam Neely. I'm, I don't know. I haven't seen him do it. But if I had to put money on someone talking about this with some authority, of course, and research and uh, probably great insight, it would be Adam Neely. So having not... I don't know, but I would kind of bet that if you went and searched something along those lines, like enharmonic equivalents or, you know, is... Uh, What's uh, is E is E and F flat, or is B and C flat the same thing? For instance, um, I'm sure there's a, an argument for for no, but in the practical application of music, and speaking from someone who's had a 25 plus year career uh, doing what I actually well longer than that, it's, it's getting closer to 30 uh, scarily now that I've been playing live and playing professionally and being handed music to read as a professional musician, uh, you know, in, in return for, for payment, for financial gain um, or, or reward rather. Yeah, I did, nobody's handed me something in, in F flat major. 
uh, or, or C flat. You know, I, I don't mind seeing the note C flat um, when it comes to uh, when it comes to like A flat minor. Uh, well, let's let's just say they're like I, I can't stand a, a, an E sharp or something. When when a piece of music software, when somebody's copy and pasted something and and, and transposed it, and the music software puts a, an E, uh, puts an F and calls it an E sharp. I mean, that's a big no no. That's just wasting people's time when they're reading music. There's kind of for me. As a professional musician, if I see that, I think there's no excuse for that. I think that's total bullshit. Um, even though I'm sure there are some modern composers that, that dig deep into all of that stuff, and I'm sure there are a lot of arguments to be made for um, different sort of tonality associations, how it has to be written a certain way to make sense, blah, 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 blah. I, I don't deal with the modern classical music world, so I wouldn't know. Um, and in terms of being a bass player... There are 12 keys, basically. Of course, there are some exceptions, and you will see... Uh, actually, maybe that's the most common one, like the D-flat minor as a chord symbol. Um, you, you might see that once in a while. Um, I much prefer... It, you know, if it, again, it's like in context. I much prefer to see C sharp and an F sharp, especially if it's a two five and it's going to be. It it just makes sense in in the key. I hate to see you know D flat and G flat seven. The uh, I hate seeing a flat key on the dominant chord going to uh, a sharp key on the on the one that that drives me absolutely mental so if the key was d flat for instance and again it's probably a glitch in a piece of computer software a notation software that they've put g sharp seven to d flat major seven i i cannot stand that so it's no it's a flat to d flat it's a flat dominant to a flat um to a flat root um, so yeah, that's uh, I don't actually know how we got there, but oh yeah, with the Anthony Wellington thing and and I, it's as an exercise, I wouldn't I don't discount it. He's not, again, he's not wrong that those things exist, and as an exercise, I'm sure it's awesome. I mean, I I used to do things like reading tenor and an alto clef, for instance, uh, you know, as an exercise. I used to read treble clef but in b flat and transpose at sight to concert you know it was a cool exercise at the time but have i used it a single time like any of those three things professionally speaking in the last 20 years of course not not a fucking once and, and I, I doubt i ever will you know i have of course been handed a b flat part that has chord symbols on it or or just any part and told like you know you the, the, the parts in c or no that's not pick c the, the parts in a flat but we're actually we're going to play it in b so okay i've got to transpose everything a minor third at sight um so yeah but those are like chord symbols rather than melodies very rarely is a is a bass part coming from a b flat or an e flat like a tenor or an alto saxophone part so yeah, uh, as as much as Anthony is 100% right, and there are way more than 12 keys, technically speaking, what you'll actually end up um, working on, you know, I would say that um, there's definitely uh, it, there's definitely some some value in practicing some common ones. You know, I think maybe F sharp as as G flat is is absolutely one of those. Um, but then I would never think like A sharp major. Never. Or C double flat major. All the same notes, right? So yeah, there are there are a couple of common ones. Um, so maybe there might be 14 or 15 things you want to practice. But at the end of the day, the notes, the way they sound are all the same. So you are actually only practicing 12 sets of notes regardless of the label you put on them. Um, so yeah, just be aware of that and... Um, that's kind of my take on the whole 30 plus keys. I can't remember exactly how many it was, but I know it was way up there. Um, so yeah, um, like I said, cycle of fourths um, and how quickly you can get through. Even this is kind of a medium tempo. It wasn't super slow, um, but I could get through two my major minor arpeggios, two two octave arpeggios in each key and go through all 12 keys in less than a minute. Uh, another thing I'll use is the, is the circle of fifths. Circle of fifths being... Um, I'm running out of <laughs> running out of real estate there. There it is in in all different octaves. That was basically all twelve notes of the chromatic scale, but voiced out in fifths. Um, 
and yeah, so I'll, in, instead of going fourths, I'll go in fifths, slightly different sound. See, I, I like it, especially with minor major arpeggios like that, it's quite dramatic. Um, has a bit more of a classical uh, sound to it to my ear and the cycle of force has a little bit more of a jazz vibe to it even though the two are completely interchangeable and are applicable in both uh, both uh, realms of music to my ear um, and then like there are so many other ways of doing it like I said earlier on in the podcast you don't have to play all 12 keys in a cycle like that it's it's a great exercise it's nice to have a framework sometimes to be able to be like okay this is the thing and i don't have to think about it and i go in these patterns and i get to cover the entire fretboard but we also have you know chromaticism of course playing 12 keys but just by half steps instead of a fourth or a fifth um let's go with the old favorite <laughs> the old two five line but i started on so d minor to g and i'm just descending in half steps now this is a shorter phrase obviously and i'm, I'm able to fly through 12 keys at this kind of medium tempo in no time at all i mean i'm I think I'm 12 keys in less than 20 seconds there. So again, highlighting how um, efficient you can be with your time and cover a lot of range in the instrument. I started there on the 14th fret. I'm just descending kind of medium tempo in half steps right down to the second fret right there. Um, that's in w on one um, string set. I would encourage you to starting on the same fret but down a fourth just to get that challenge of, you know, there are a couple of different challenges here when you play on the bottom three strings of the instrument, I think, um, in that, of course, the, the strings are thicker, so there's a little bit more of a challenge. It's you're playing melodically on a thicker uh, and eventually much lower, um, uh, thicker string and a lower register of the instrument. Um, and you don't have that, uh, that, that, that um, b string below to sort of, uh, for, the, for the fingers to follow through. Um, and you don't have that finger below for the thumb to rest on in the case of my technique and the way my right hand, my picking hand works. So on, on the bottom string, I'm using the pickup instead of a string to rest my thumb on, um, but it takes a lot more control you don't want your fingers, your, your first and, I'm playing using first and second finger here on my picking hand, you don't want them coming through so far that you're expend, expending you know, too much energy or too much range of motion. You want it to be as efficient on the lower strings as it is on the, on the, on the higher strings. So yeah, I, I play a five string bass that gives me, for this shape, played fingered this way, gives me three different string sets. The bottom three, kind of the center three, the E, A, uh, the A, D, G, and then for me, I have a high C, so D, G, C. And really, I'm looking for that fluidity, that, you know, no matter where I am on the instrument, which string I'm playing on, um, really, really important. And the fact that you can do that kind of blast, and I don't mean blast like, oh, just do it quick and get it out of the way, but really encompass the entire range of the instrument just with that one idea, three different string sets. Um, I'm, I'm, that was just an octave, you know, I'm not playing to the maximum of my range here. As I move uh, move down the instrument, I could start a little higher, maybe um, Fender P bass or Fender Jazz, I think has a high E flat on the G string. That's probably the highest note of, of a pretty standard four string bass. So my first, my in that position, my first available two is an F minor to P flat. And that's starting on the 17th fret. I had to count those. So I can go from the 17th fret but to the open string basically all the way down. I'm getting way more than an octave. There we go. 
Um, and of course, don't don't if you're doing it one way, always do it the other. <laughs> So that's 12 keys, and now we go into the next octave. And I have a little more extended range, so I can get way up on that same string set to there. Uh, technically, I can play it there, but I don't have the access really, nor would I ever play that kind of material in that range on the instrument. But there's yet another example of, of excuse me, of 12 keys and fluidity, you know, and, and connectivity and just being connected to the instrument at, at every point, at every contact point of the bass. There shouldn't be a weak part or a part that you fear. I think that's the, be that's the best thing is like uh, knowing that doing this, that by doing this stuff, you like d you diminish the fear and the anxiety that you may potentially have with certain areas or certain keys and you boost your confidence like, that's the best thing like there's there's not a single note or chord or key signature or part of the instrument that i'm fearful of now of course yeah i've been doing it a lot of years um so i do have some e experience but that feeling has only come from doing exactly these things that i continue to do to this day it's not like you do them for a while and then okay you get to this this point and once you're past that line like great you're good forever at least not for me anyway my experience has been like okay i need to continue to work at this i need to continue to make sure these things are very much on uh, uh, available to me like right there on the surface they can't be buried uh deep to the point where i, I forget about them or forget to work on them or, or forget their importance or don't lend enough weight to the foundation of what I do, the fundamentals of the instrument and of the music. So always important to, for me anyway, has really been important to continually work on that stuff. <clears throat> and then of course, we've talked about uh, cycle of fourths, uh, circle of fifths, <laughs> um, in half steps. Of course, I, I do a lot of things in whole steps through transcription and through the nature of how I assimilate vocabulary, how I learn music, how I learn phrases and lines and um, and how I get to build my improvisational vocabulary is through transcribing little snippets, little moments from other people. And as soon as I get that moment, um, let's see if I can remember one right now because I'm transcribing a lot of stuff for the New Giant Steps book. Um, complete solos and fragments and 251 stuff and all kinds of things. So, uh, uh, ah, this is one. I don't know if I've played this one in the podcast before. Uh, so the way Giant Steps works, for instance, is another great, this is what I'm highlighting with the book, actually. Uh, maybe I've talked about this a little bit, but if you're new to the podcast, the new book I'm working on highlights the fact that Coltrane wrote, John Coltrane wrote, giant steps as an exercise initially and i'm kind of like the uh, you by doing everything in the book yes you will inevitably get better at playing giant steps absolutely i can guarantee that if you do the work in the book but more importantly um what i hope you get better at is learning and knowing what what your process is and enhancing your process and you know getting specificity into your in into your daily routine that works for you because we're all so different and using it as the exercise it was originally designed for. Like, I don't go out and play giant steps on a gig. Um, it's one of the most overplayed and, and I don't want to say worn out, but I get worn out listening to most people play it um, because it's like, oh, well, it's, okay, great. It does, you know, it, it's really easy to sound like you're practicing when you play that tune on a gig. It's um, one of the harder things to do with giant steps, I think, is to play more perhaps modally or have longer melodic phrases. It's very easy to get locked into these do 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 you know, play these, uh, these uh, to get these kind of major pentatonic shapes and, and very kind of blocky in terms of the harmony. Um, much more of a challenge to play loose on that song. But as an exercise and as a way to move between keys and understand relationships and common tones and, you know, there are a thousand things we could go into it, into on it right now. I got to pick, 
pick one. I mean, a co- common tone thing is is actually is is a good thing to think about. Common tones and voice leading, especially with the opening three bars. You've got you've got B major to D seven to G major, G major seven to B flat, B flat seven to E flat. So you've got this one, five, one, five, one. Like everything is either a one, a two, or a five in that tune. There's, a, there's also the other thing is that Giant Steps is um, gets way too much credit for being like one of the hardest songs to play. I think there's a stigma that comes with that, and I've definitely talked about that a little bit before. And I'm really trying to like like demystify the whole thing and take away all the myths and just. It, not expose it for what it is, just it, uh, you know, highlight it for for how great it is and and what we can be using it for in terms of how it applies to so much other harmony, especially in jazz, because everything is a five one five one two five one five one five one um, two five one. Guess what? Two five one. So if you if you look at common tones between those chords, for instance, to to navigate the tune, I know we're getting away from twelve keys a little bit, but it is going to circle back because um, it's things like this that I want to get you to do in twelve keys. But let me show you sort of the function of it, um, and you know, picking a common tone, even if you're just looking at chord tones, like common chord tones, not even common scale tones. So then you restrict the number of notes that you have to choose from uh, in each tonality. So with B major seven, one, five, one, three, five, seven, you got uh, B, D sharp, F sharp, A sharp. Um, with D seven, D, F sharp, A, C sharp. So already we have an F sharp in common between those two and when we go to G major 7 we have F sharp in common as well so F sharp covers the first three chords pretty nicely and then we can voice lead because our next available chord tone is F great it's a half step away it's a really nice place to voice lead I love voice leading in half steps whole steps at most a minor third but really half steps and whole steps if I can so we go now we have to go to our next available. I think we have two chord tones available on E flat. We have the root, and we have the major third. They're a whole step away from our previous melody note. I think the the G natural is just more more interesting. I, just an octave sounds kind of square. So So just with one note on each chord and you've navigated through the first three bars of giant steps just by understanding some common tones now the idea is to be able to do that you know giant steps rotates a lot so we're moving in three different key centers here b major uh, g major and e flat um, so that's already three things and i think this is where the discipline to do that in kind of like a group like that it's not just one key with giant steps it's three keys that it's moving it's kind of based around kind of based around the augmented triad in terms of the root motion the overall like bigger picture root motion that's what all the two fives once you get into the second half of the tune so it's e flat and then to uh, to g uh, which is a major third and then a two five a major third away from that to to be so we this augmented triad room motion um but then why not do that at that cluster of of uh, of two fives up a whole step up a half step sorry and you all you've got to do is go uh three half steps up so you do it start on e flat e f f sharp so four places actually and then you're back to then you're up on G which you've already have which you have already had as the second key signature in the second tone center in the very first iteration of it so there are ways to move 12 keys in very kind of like less conventional sounding ways a little more challenging of course um, and that's something with the Giant Steps book that I'm looking to explore um, because we can have <laughs> So those are three key centers right there, right? We've got E flat to 
G, and then up a major third to B. Now, if we move that whole thing up a whole step, uh, we're going to have E, A flat, and C. So um, uh, there's E, and then A flat. Uh, a flat is going to be and then C so you could cycle I think the discipline is to really get it down in one key maybe the original key so we're moving E flat G and B that's something I've done a, a lot of just cycling those um, in fact I do have something in the looper but let's just put um, uh, how am I going to do this so something kind of medium tempo um, one two oh um, two three two, three, two. Well, that wow the looper the looper in the helix gotta say not the greatest let's try that again Okay, so another important thing as I'm playing, I'm thinking about it, is I'm playing those, this 2-5 idea. It starts on the fifth of the two chord on each one, so um, it's not the most challenging thing to do as long as you know how to get to the fifth of each two chord in three key signatures. I would take it a lot slower if you're not, if you haven't done this before. But as an add-on to that, just working in these three key signatures first, three tone centers first, I would try and challenge myself to do it in different ranges of the instrument. Exactly the same note selection, but in different octaves. So instead of maybe... So I'm, I'm obviously branching out there and not staying you know, strictly on that same idea. But I'm working in different ranges of the instrument as much as I can, being conscious of playing similar ideas in different octaves, just for a little more control and a little more of a challenge. I think that's important to remember that we don't have to... It's not that complicated, right? I, th this wasn't some revolutionary... I, I didn't just say... I didn't just teach you how to split the atom or something. I just said play in a different octave. Um, something that if you can do it in one octave, you can generally do it in another. Because as bass players, I say it, we do play the dumbest, easiest instrument out there. And uh, it, it's so symmetrical everywhere that if you know this, you know this, you know that... Um, you know, it really is not that difficult to move similar shapes around the instrument. So, again, just being aware that those are some of your options. I think that's, that, that's you know, that's probably like the, the best thing about any of my books or any book, actually, that you have ever used that has information that, that is like, oh, this is good information, this really works for me. The fact that it's just there as a reference to open up and be like, so what, ah, that was it. And you just get back to it, you know, and if if that's coming to the podcast like this and being reminded, practicing 12 keys, do it in fourths, do it in the circle of fifths, half steps, whole steps. We didn't even get to whole steps and minor thirds. I'll do a little bit of that in a second. Um, maybe use the giant steps, you know, the, the, the concept of having those three key centers, which are you know, really f about as far away from each other as you could possibly get, actually, when you think about um, E flat and G and B. Or, you know, E and A flat and C, or F and A and D flat, G flat, 
B flat and D, like any of those options based around those augmented triads. Those four, that's it, those four triads. And each of those, using each of the notes in those triads as the root motion. That's the second half of Giant Steps, but in all 12 keys. So the, the, another thing about working on 12 keys is not just about playing little fragments and, you know, the, the arpeggios. It's not about playing that, like, symmetrical kind of parallel thing only. You know, it's, it's about working on tunes in, in 12 keys. You know, playing the entirety of Giant Steps in completely different keys with different starting points. Uh, that's a... A, a great challenge I think it's something that you can possibly work up to and maybe set as a goal and like hey I'm gonna figure out how to play giant steps or whatever tune it is you know just playing a blues in 12 keys can be great you know like start you know, like understand where you're at in your ability level and your process and start where is applicable start with something that's manageable it's it's amazing the amount we already know but have yet to unlock I think whenever I get uh, in a situation with a student and and they're kind of struggling with a specific thing and I ask them a few questions and get them to play something and, and come to find out they kind of already had had the had all the information and most of the time the ability to answer their own question. There were just a few, couple of little things that were disconnected, a couple of links in the chain that weren't quite there. And I think the more you you know, look into your own playing. And I've, I've talked about this ad infinitum. This is another thing that I will continue to repeat until the day I die, um, is that you really need to, um, you really need to be recording yourself, like recording all your practice, recording all your, your concerts, uh, your rehearsals, really everything. So you can be, um, the most in tune critic of your own playing. And I don't mean critic by being hard on yourself or being self deprecating or anything like that. I mean critic in the sense of like you know yourself better than anyone else. Uh, you also know how that relates to what you want to hear from yourself. And if you're honest, when you critique uh, what you hear after you've recorded yourself practice or rehearse or perform, you know the the, the distance between the real and feel like you, you, you know, the difference between what you feel in the moment and you perhaps thought it was good, but then you listen back and you're like, Oh, that's not actually the reality. And you know, the difference between the reality and the goal. And hopefully those two things are always quite far apart. I, I know they are for me. Actually, I'm going to take the bass off here, give my back a rest. Um, cause it's a good thing to think about. I think something I think about a lot, something that really helps me in terms of my process and kind of re, like the ever, it's not not so much about ever shifting goalposts. Like I don't shift them. I think they shift themselves um, just because I'm always discovering new stuff I don't understand and stuff that I know, oh shit, I need to work on that. You know, so the goalposts kind of get get moved on, on their own constantly. But the, the reality and goals being far apart is uh, is not a bad position to be in because it means you're always sort of searching. You know, you're always letting your curiosity uh, be the driving force um, in what you do. And I think there's possibly no uh, more powerful way forward than that. Um, it, it takes a lot of components to fall into place to to be effective and to work. Um, and I, I don't think I'm... Like I'm good at it, but I'm not good at it all the time. And it goes up and down. It kind of ebbs and flows as to how effective it is for me. Um, and I think I hear that in a, a bit from a lot of people I talk to on the subject. It's like a constant work in progress. And it's also, I'm realizing the older I get, the more I work and the more, the more things I commit to doing and the more things I'm passionate about doing, the actual thing, the goal, the thing that you you're heading towards you're careening towards or striving towards is maybe about five percent of of the whole picture and the, like i deem like the album i'm working on right now the thing we just launched the pre-sale for like it's like it, everything's kicking off and there are all these huge plans taking place it's not like i'm going you know for anyone who doesn't know i live in los angeles and it's not like um 
It's not like I play in LA with my guys, with my trio all the time, and we're super slick and rehearsed, and we're going to a local studio for a few days. No, not at all. You know, my piano player lives in London, my drummer lives in Paris, and we're recording in Argentina. It's the other side of the world. So the actual, the release of the album, when the music finally comes out, the, the, the moment that will be public facing, shall we say, the moment everyone else will, um, you know, like, unless you were involved here uh, in the journey, which is something that's actually a good parallel thing to talk about. It's something I'm trying to involve more people in through the pre-sale and through just talking about the process, doing podcast episodes, making videos, bringing people along for the ride. But I think that will be a much smaller dedicated audience, you know, if we could get it to like the Kevin Kelly, a thousand true fans, if that was a thing, you know, and everyone was, was putting in $25 to be a part of this journey for the six months that it's going to take between now and, and releasing the album or whatever, that would, this would be huge. This would be a mega success. And the, the album would be epic. I, I said in the, I think in the pre-sale on the video, it kind of, it, how epic the album is already going to be gr- going to be great musically i think but how epic it becomes with extracurricular stuff sort of depends on how many people get involved um despite the fact that it's not a crowdfunding thing it's not reliant on a financial goal in order to green light the project to make it happen we're going no matter what sell 20 copies or twenty we we're going to argentina to make the record so those things are all happening and and the goal like i said the 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 bigger picture, the bigger public facing picture when the album comes out in November and then we're on tour and people are coming to shows and maybe they'll even be physical. I don't know. I'd love to do vinyl. God damn. I keep saying it. And I just have not got it together yet, but maybe there'll be some vinyl in Europe on the road. Who knows? But that, that will be the public facing thing. We'll, we'll only be about 5% of the whole process and the success will have happened like long before is it like anything like that happens? The success for me personally, um, like the emotional success will have happened months before anything sort of tangible, pu- public facing and tangible is, is in existence. So it's really about the work, like doing the work. I always talk about like being in love with the work and how l- lucky I think I am that I just fell in love with doing the work right from the get go. And I've never sort of never looked back and I can just get lost. It's like that thing of like, how do you know what you're passionate about, right? Like what is your passion? What is your, your thing? And I think it's the thing where you lose track of time. And I've always thought that about music because I can really lose like a day and be like, oh shit, it was 9 a.m. just a minute ago and now it's 11 p.m., and I've been doing this thing like all day. I remember that very vividly as a kid, being able to spend, you know, coming down in the morning, having a little bit of breakfast in my PJs and just sitting down, you know, initially with a classical guitar when I was younger, when 10, 11 years old, and just playing all day and being having, having to be reminded to eat lunch and dinner and actually not getting out with the PJs most of the day, if at all, before I had to go back to bed again. And that whole, you know, people talk about the 10,000 hours and in music circles, people talk about, hey, do you really, did you ever really practice 10 or 12 hours? Yes, absolutely, a day. Yes, I did. Hundreds of days, uh, if not thousands. Um, So, and that whole 10,000 hours thing, that's not the... (laughs) <laughs> that's not the uh, the goal. That's not the upper l- limit of of what it takes to become proficient at something. That's like the basic requirement of just cracking the door and having a look inside the room. Ten thousand hours, you're not walking across the threshold, as far as I'm concerned. Ten thousand hours is yet yeah, great. What about the next thirty thousand hours you're going to put into it? And how do you feel about that? And does that bring you joy? And are you motivated to do it? And is that honestly what you want to do, or is that just something you read about or you saw in a YouTube video? Um, yeah, really, in, very interesting to think back to, you know, thirty something years ago to when I first started playing music and how that has never gone away. So that's yeah, that's the metric of like. Is it working? Is it my goal? Is it my passion? Am I on it? That's, I constantly sort of check back in with that. And 
the 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 common thread is that I can still at this you know with all of these other things going on, wife, kid, dog, cat, house, touring, sideman, studio, projects, podcast, with all of this other stuff going on, um, you know, running four or five different businesses and and doing like just really kind of stretched a little bit too thin if I'm honest. I can still totally get lost in in the process of making and playing music and lose track of time and um and maybe happiness uh, because i i I get a great amount of joy from that and i think maybe the older i get the more i think about like what what is happening we are so far off 12 keys here by the way (laughs) but it is all kind of part of the process um when it comes down to do I have the will? How do I have the willpower to, to do this every day still? You know, and I'm talking to you, whoever's listening out there, about something kind of very fundamental and pretty basic uh, on some level. But the fact that it still brings me so much happiness and as a result of the work I'm afforded to operate on 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 a level that gives me access to things that I would otherwise miss out on if I wasn't doing that work every day. So I guess it is, it is really related. And back to the thing about like, what is, what is happiness? And to me, it's like enjoying, enjoying the time I have, like enjoying the passing of time. And for that not to be arduous or boring or, you know, like enjoying the process. And I think that's been the like sort of underlying theme of my, um, entire professional life, uh, personal life. There, <laughs> there are some issues there. Not gonna lie. Um, thankfully, working on them and have been for some time. So, hopefully, that kind of comes up to par with the with the career stuff. And of course, they're all intertwined, and one affects the other <coughs> in, in both directions. So it's a it's a huge balancing act. But the over, um, like the overarching sort of all-encompassing feeling is that I'm very happy with like you know, enjoying like the passage of time the passing of time which is uh which is I'm very grateful for and the more I can share that the better uh I think I've been sharing a little too much today maybe I don't know um give me some feedback on all of it I hope you get some stuff out of the 12 keys thing it's really uh really something that is important in my life has helped me immensely I hope it helps you don't forget, all the tour dates are at yannickwizdala.com. Steve Smith, Vital Information 40th Anniversary Tour starts in just a couple of weeks on the West Coast, and then we go to the East Coast in the summer. My my dates, I'll have dates in Chile and Argentina and Uruguay as well, as far as I'm aware. Going to have like four or five concerts while I'm down in South America, then four days in the studio. The pre-sale is happening now. Uh, you can get involved. You can be a part of this journey and uh, watch it all unfold. Don't forget, if you uh, are not, on my newsletter, my mailing list. That's all totally free to sign up for. Tons of stuff happening there every week, including this podcast. So chances are, if you're hearing this, you're already there. But if you're not, go to yannickwizdala.substack.com. It's all linked either in the show notes here on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or below the description of the video if you're watching on YouTube. Smash the like button. That really helps um, spread this spread this around and, and, and gets more people to check it out. And and the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests can get. I've got a bunch of guests in mind for the next couple of months, which is going to be a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed the Marcus Reiter interview last week. I had a lot of fun talking to Marcus. Hopefully we'll get to do it again sometime, maybe in Europe. Um, but that's it. That's uh, that's the podcast for today. Appreciate you guys and girls of the base world hanging out with me. And uh, yeah, see you on the next one. Mm-hmm.